Okay, what's up, guys? I'm going to give you my top 12 big board. First one, you know, it's going to be totally half-assed. Uh, don't take it with uh, too much seriousness because I've basically taken this year off. Uh, having done the draft, covered it, you know, uh, and having basically put together what I would argue was the best big board that there was around last year. Uh, you know, and then uh, Draft Express hiding within ESPN and the back pages on the Insider where no one can see it. And uh, I lost the sense of competition. And the only thing that I felt like I was competing with was perfection. And it drove me nuts that I missed on uh, Donovan Mitchell. And as I picked up on after about one day of Summer League, I missed out on Don, Don, Donovan Mitchell because uh, it was an ego-driven mistake because Draft Express was the one hyping Donovan Mitchell before I did. And even though Donovan Mitchell checked off every box from the high character to the athleticism to the strength, uh, the 3 and D, all of that stuff, um, I, I let my ego get in the way and convinced myself that he wasn't as good. Anyway, guys, you know, uh, but... Next, you know, and the other thing is, guys, like the day after the draft, when you're a draft Nick guy, the day after the draft, you feel like Santa Claus on December 26th. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, I got to wait a whole year to do this again. You know? And the other thing is the only v videos that were getting real views was the Lonzo Ball, you know, criticizing Lonzo Ball and his offense and his family, you know? And criticizing Markel Fultz for being lazy and kind of chubby and having that D-low body language. So, uh, you know, being an NBA generalist, uh, it's much more of an ongoing cycle. You know what I mean? It covers more areas. It includes the draft and all of that stuff. And you never feel like Santa Claus on, on December 26th. You never feel like you got to wait a whole year for anyone to start watching your draft videos again, you know? Not to say there wasn't people watching draft videos year round, but the potential audience was like 500, 1,000 views, you know? And uh, so anyway, I'm just trying to change it, be more of a generalist and not include draft, but I'm, I didn't, I wasn't even interested in watching college basketball this year. It's kind of strange, but with the Celtics having such a great run, I didn't miss it at all. So let's just talk about the draft, you know, if, if, <laughs> If I end up being somewhat accurate in my big board, I'll probably end up bragging about it. Uh, hopefully not, right? Hopefully not. And I don't take it too seriously because I haven't even ultimately watched any of these dudes play like an entire game, any of them, basically. That's how bad it is this year, guys. So this is just take it, take it all with a grain of salt. I'm just an NBA generalist now. I'm no longer a draft expert, all right? <sighs> So Michael Porter Jr., you might have heard today, had some issue with his hip. He couldn't even get out of bed today is what the rumor is. There's a small chance that this is just him trying to get himself forced to a team that he prefers, like maybe the Chicago Bulls or something like that, you know? When you're a high draft pick and you see all these trash teams, why would you want to play for any of them, right? And uh, if you can get your way to one of these decent cities or whatever that you feel more comfortable at, why wouldn't you do that? Keep in mind, he's doing all his uh, pre-draft workouts in Chicago. Uh, he only met with Chicago doctors to examine him, right? And he said, I'll give you that medical information from the Chicago staff and uh, to all the other teams. But I'm only, you know, it's all about Chicago, it would appear. And, uh, and who knows if he had some inside deal with the Chicago front office where they put out exceptionally alarming medical information even though that medical information they did send out was not alarming at all. But I think the real issue is that he does have really alarming medical situation. Front, and, and, you know, he didn't, he didn't do the medicals at the combine. That was a big red flag, right? He was at the combine. He was getting measured at the combine. But he wasn't letting them look at his back, and he wasn't giving teams any of the uh, medical information. And now we have he had a big workout plan for all these top teams, including Sacramento with the number two pick. The pay between the number two pick and the number seven pick is like, it's got to be at least six, seven million dollars over four years, maybe more than that, you know? It's, yeah, it's significant. And, uh, and now it's looking like with his, with being not, being unable to get out of bed today, uh, it's looking like he could drop to anywhere in the late lottery. 
who knows, maybe even lower. And uh, so we look at him and we see that he's got really long legs, right? And really skinny legs, right? And that means that his torso is actually really short. And, you're t and that means the center of balance is really high. Okay, so his legs are probably longer than someone like Christos Porzingis or even Yao Ming. He's probably got, yeah, Yao Ming might not even have longer legs than this, all right? So it's kind of that spider look, you know. Uh, Kevin Durant gets called Durantula, but that was more because of his super long arms. But this guy's got those, and Lonzo Ball kind of had this style of legs too. And we see that Lonzo Ball can't really bang in the paint much, can't really post guys up, can't really, and he's, you know, very injury prone too, so... Um, but this guy's got even longer, even skinnier legs for his size. And, uh, now he's got it. We see that he's got these back problems and he had said that it was caused by injury. But, uh, this, this, you know, this, there's a new draft guy on YouTube and he makes really good videos. I will link in the description or the comments. I forget his name right now, but anyway, he, he's really good. Uh, and, uh, what he was saying is he doesn't have any proof that, the injury was actually caused by a fall in a game like Michael Part Porter has wisely claimed, right? Michael Porter Jr. would want us to believe that it was just from a from an injury, from a bit from a bad fall during a game, but uh, doesn't it may very well not be the case. It may have something to do with his posture, and it may just very well be an ongoing problem with his weird posture and maybe some stiff hips. And maybe those stiff hips, you know, uh, are starting to give him problems now that he's working out every day and training hard for the draft, you know. And so he just might have some physical problems that will be lingering for his entire career and hold him short. And the fact is that what would make this guy a great prospect would be if his back wasn't stiff and if he could get low in his stance and he could generally bend his knees and stay low and move laterally better on offense and especially defense, right? Um, but if he's got this weird back thing and this weird posture and he's got the, you know, he's got the ongoing back issues, he's going to be stiff, he's going to be upright, and that's going to tell you he's more of a power forward, right? But then you look at these long skinny legs in the high center of gravity and these other power forwards whose hips, you know, are, whose legs are a lot shorter. They're, they're going to have a lot lower center of gravity and their torsos are probably going to be longer too. And when your torso is longer, that means your center of gravity is like, you know, where your hips and your guts are, you know, your intestines and all of that stuff that he it's heavy mass, you know, and it weighs a lot more than 20 little legs like this. Like I have short legs and a long torso and uh, my center of gravity is actually really low. And, uh, and it's really good for leverage and all of that stuff, you know, um, cause your, cause your guts and your intestines or whatever, way more than these skinny ass legs. So that drops your, uh, center of gravity. His center of gravity is like way the hell up here. It's crazy high. And so he's never going to be, a, he's never going to be able to really pound in the post. He's never going to really be able to be physical because with that high center of gravity, he can just be pushed off with the slightest breeze. You know what I mean? And, uh, so he's... He's almost, with his injury concerns with his back, if it wasn't for the back, he could be an elite small forward, okay? And he could stay low. Um, but the other, the other issue is, as a small forward on the perimeter, you know, we, we hear that he has a, a kind of a slow first step, right? And part of that is because his legs are so damn long. And when you have short legs, uh, you can make those first, you can make those steps uh, a lot quicker. And with this lower center of gravity, you can turn the corner. You know, it's just like, think about, uh, think about like cars, you know, the low sports cars, like the Lamborghinis and Porsches and BMWs even because they're so low, they can turn, you know, really fast, but picture like a Land Rover, right. And try going fast and turning with a Land Rover. You start almost tipping over, right? So that's the kind of body he has is more of like that Land Rover type up high, and that's going to stop him from probably ever developing a really good first step and kind of turning the corner around these picks and attacking the rim really fast, especially because he has these back issues where he's got to be so upright and stiff all the time. So he's basically going to be a really good jump shooter, 
uh, he's basically going to be a taller Joe Johnson or Rudy Gay or something like that is what it's looking like right now. And so I was praising this guy to the heavens before, but I was kind of seeing him through rose colored glasses and thinking that he wouldn't have this rigid, inflexible spine. And now he's got these hip injuries too. Like we just saw Isaiah Thomas with the bad hips, right? And he had the hip deformity or whatever, but just having tight, just having tight, weird hips with the weird back and you know, there's just something going on in this whole posture thing going on that could totally derail his career and, uh, or could relegate him to being, you know, a really nice stretch four or a big, um, small forward who just knocks down a bunch of jumpers. And because he's got the scoring identity, um, you know, it's going to be a little weird. Is he going to even accept that role? Is he going to even be happy in that role? And, uh, and because he was so hyped for so long as a player in the prospects, he's, uh, yeah, it's just sometimes the hungrier guys who didn't have all the recognition and glory from their younger days, sometimes they just generally work harder. They accept more of a team role. They're more team players and they don't have these huge egos that get in the way of their own success and team success. So with all those physical questions, you know, if it wasn't for these huge physical red flags, you'd kind of ignore to a larger extent some of those uh some of those ego and um you know personality type issues uh, but with that um yeah unfortunately uh unfortunately i can totally see why he he wouldn't be a top 5 pick unless he's totally faking this injury stuff and uh i could even see him follow i mean an injured an injured um Michael Porter Jr. versus a healthy Kevin Knox, who I believe is younger. And they're basically somewhat the same player, you know. Uh, but Kevin Knox may still be growing. Probably not, but he'll fill out more. And uh, I don't know. They're very, very similar now, aren't they? I don't think Kevin Knox should be anywhere near to it. Okay, so let's get let's start talking, all right? Big board, 1.0. Number one, DeAndre Jordan. Can you see that? Uh... Yeah, you can see that. All right, so DeAndre Jordan, number one. He's the one guy, in my opinion, who could be a real crazy franchise player, perennial all-star with his underrated post-offense. And, uh, you know, it'll be a weird fit with uh, today's modern game or whatever, but this guy could be a real absolutely dominant player in the port post who deserves to be a number one option. It'll be interesting. He's going to Phoenix. Um which is his hometown, but that's not really a concern for me. But, uh, you know, he's going to be playing next to Devin Booker, who just loves to chuck, you know. And it's not like Devin Booker can just uh, chill out and help you on defense. If Devin Booker's not scoring, he's not really helping you out at all. Uh, and then you're going to have Josh Jackson, who's also going to want to get his. But I see DeAndre Ayton and Josh Jackson being a really good fit, uh, just athletically kind of dominate from the, well, yeah, but if, Josh Jackson's not even playing shooting guard. That he's not living up to his potential either. Uh, but DeAndre Jordan just has a chance to be a chance to average twenty five points, if not thirty points, if he really gets on a team that really feeds him the ball in his future with that crazy size and athleticism. And maybe playing at home in Phoenix will uh, will help him. It could hurt him if he hangs out with the wrong crowd, but I haven't heard anything about that. So I think he's going to be uh, just fine. But you also have the curse of the number one pick. Recall Markel Fultz. Recall all these guys. Either guys get these huge egos and they just, you know, they just uh, become more about themselves than the team, like John Wall and Kyrie Irving. Or sometimes the pressure can just kind of cripple them, like perhaps we saw with the Cleveland guy, Anthony Bennett, and uh, some other guys. You know, it just very very frequently the number one pick just doesn't quite work out and i think a lot of it has to do with the crazy pressure of being the number one pick and also that huge ego boost and sense of entitlement that can develop from being the number one pick you know who is anyone to tell you anything when you're the number one pick right you don't even have to be coachable that's kyrie irving right so but over, he's just the only he's he's so much more talented than everybody else now that michael porter jr has uh has some major spine and hip issues apparently that uh you just roll with him all the way at number one and it's pretty much a no-brainer and 
Vegas has it as a no-brainer as well. You have to bet like $1,000 to make like $10 or $100 or something like that. So, all right, number two, Mo Bamba. And uh, he's got a whole lot of talent. But against certain matchups like um, like uh, Joel Embiid or something, it's really hard to say whether he's going to even be able to stay on the court. But because he has that freakish wingspan, he should be fine, especially if his team makes it a big point to help him out. He'll probably be a rock-solid player. And uh, hopefully he can have some power forward ability as well. But it doesn't look like his feet are necessarily quite that fast or his uh, his defensive basketball IQ quite that high. But if it is and he can play a couple different positions, then uh, you know, just by knocking down those long jumpers, um, which he should be able to continue to develop, even if it's just from the mid-range, uh, he should be one of these low-key uh, 15 and 10 and 3 guys or something like that, uh, like a better version of Miles Turner. Um, and, of course, his upside is something more like Kristaps Porzingis, although Por- even Porzingis has been a little disappointing from the uh, plus-minus perspe- perspective real plus minus in these other other advanced stats because he's not quite as impactful as you would want on defense and by shooting all these long two-point shots unless you're knocking them down at an elite rate uh you're really not really providing a whole lot you know you're just an average shooter shooting below average shots and uh even though they might look beautiful when they go in and even though even if he could hit them on high volume and actually have the points add up it actually wouldn't be all that impactful uh, but he's next to eight and he's got the second best um, second best talent level and uh, probably going to have a good, great work ethic too. So uh, yeah, you know, be, behind his defense and his ability to stretch the floor out a little bit, uh, that's your number two. Marvin Bagley I see as a uh, some variation of um, Blake Griffin or Julius Randle. He's got a very different body type than those guys, but his his mentality and his game and his talents are basically the same. And Blake Griffin was a great ball handler and passer, but that really never amounted to much, you know? Ultimately, Blake Griffin was a scorer and an, and an attacker like Julius Randle, and these guys would all grab lots of rebounds and score lots of points. And just from a basic, simple look at the uh, box score, you would think that they're really, really, really good players. So you could even see Marvin Bagley win Rookie of the Year or something like that. But, um, you know, he's going to be like, you know, at best case, he'll be like a a Carl Anthony Towns, and that's great. But uh, I just think behind behind the huge uh, numbers, simple stats like scoring and rebounding that he puts up, his overall impact on the game is actually going to be surprisingly uh, mediocre. But at this point, in in this draft, which I don't think is a great draft, actually, uh, I think you definitely take that at number three, if not number two, right? If he can give you 20, 20 and 12 or something like that for the next 10, 12 years, then that's great. And who is anybody to complain about a draft that even has a guy like that outside the top one or two, you know? But defensively uh he's going to struggle really bad just like um carl anthony towns does and without the sweet shooting touch that carl anthony towns has and some of these other gifts on offense uh it could be a little bit disappointing behind the numbers mikhail bridges um you know the advanced stats they just love guys like Otto porter and uh even robert covington okay these guys who are just really good defenders who can knock down three point shots and because he's got such high character and he's such a good team player, um, it's just going to overall like his, his defensive effort and his, and his incredibly high defensive IQ too. Uh, his, but his defensive effort is going to make his teammates better. Okay. It's going to make them try harder. People think that like passing makes your teammates better, you know, and makes everybody want to pass but trying really hard on defense is uh, even more impactful than that, by far, actually. And uh, Mikhail Bridges is a guy who can get all his teammates playing harder defense, kind of like Marcus Smart does, you know? And uh, because of that, 
his simple stats won't show his actual impact on the team. And most commentators and everybody else and fans are going to totally ignore that he makes his teammates better by inspiring them to give more effort on defense. Period, you know? And then that whole team is going to have that confidence from their defense that's going to affect their offense. And all of a sudden, everybody's uh, shooting confidently as well on offense because they have they have something else to, to uh, rest their confidence and self-esteem on or whatever is on the defensive side of the ball. So when you know you're making an impact, whether you make or miss, it makes it a lot easier to shoot because your whole uh, self-image and your whole confidence isn't dependent on these shots going in, you know? And I think we see that we saw that a lot with the Celtics this year, you know, where all these guys who are supposedly not very good, uh, they play like crazy on defense and they swagger through the whole game. And these guys who you don't think of as great shooters just suddenly are shooting way better. Everybody's shooting way better than everybody thinks. And all of a sudden people have to start giving credit to the coach or trying to figure out excuses for why this team is playing so good, you know? And then things like game seven of these Eastern conference finals happen and everyone, uh, forgets completely about how good they played up until that one game. So he's not necessarily the most, uh, gifted player, but with all these intangibles and everything, uh, especially on a bad team, which he's probably going to get drafted on, um, you want guys like this to make everybody embrace that team winning spirit and winning starts with effort on the defensive end. Look at any of these loser ass teams and they all fucking suck on defense, right? So you might think it's crazy to have him this high, but um, he, his defensive IQ is off the charts. He's very much a Kawhi Leonard type defender, super versatile. Oh, the other thing is um, I think he's a shooting guard, okay, not a small forward. And I think he's basically in the mold of a uh, Jalen Brown, guys. He's not nearly as strong as Jalen Brown. He's older than Jalen Brown, so he doesn't have the continued upside of Jalen Brown. But he can give you about what Jalen Brown gives you right now, which is a whole hell of a lot, right? It's not like Jalen Brown is a great passer. Uh, it's not like he's a great ball handler even. Mikael Bridges might be even worse of a ball handler than, than Jalen Brown. But Jalen Brown surprised everybody by stepping into the shooting guard position. Everyone thought he was a small forward, power forward hybrid. And all of a sudden, he's basically a top five shooting guard in the NBA as a second year player. When everyone thought he would be even worse than Avery Bradley. In reality, he turned out to be twice as good as Avery Bradley. And so uh, that's where Mikhail Bridges can really shine is that shooting guard where he can switch on to point guards, shooting guards, small forwards, and power forwards and uh, give superior height at the position to shoot over these guys and with a great athleticism to drive around them as well. Uh, his, just overall, his advanced stats are just going to be basically off the charts compared to how good people really believe this guy is and it's partly because of his own personal contributions and it's also because uh, of his impact on his teammates and making them play better making them feel more like a team more like a family and uh more like a army but big, big great army big raid brigade <laughs> that's in the foxholes right so this is a guy you want in your foxhole this is a guy who's got that sort of general type impact on his teammates so there's there's these other guys don't have that and none of these other guys even have his defensive iq you know there's nothing like it so that's that jaron jackson a guy who appears to have a very low basketball iq but he's also very young so he will get better um but you know the high rate of fouling is just really really uh awkward but another guy who's got that sort of uh miles turner type potential um call it Serge Ibaka but again um I don't see really any separation between Mo Bamba or much separation between Mo Bamba Marvin Bagley Jaron Jackson um but Jackson with a particularly low IQ uh and the tendency to foul and the bad rebounding uh I just got him slightly lower but you know like Mikhail Bridges could even end up being maybe uh number three or something or there's just it's it's a very flat draft in my opinion behind deandre Ayton, and ultimately it's not a really because these guys all have huge holes in their games right 
and uh, you know Mo Bamba with his general basketball IQ and game sense and ability to pass the ball and put the ball on the floor and uh, in addition to being really really skinny with really small hips a guy who's probably not going to be able to fill out much more than he already is and if he does fill out any more and gain any more weight he's going to be slower so um, between the injury concerns for a guy that tall and the uh, you know if he if he was a really good passer that'd be one thing but None of these guys are really good passers. Um, so they're, they're all just lacking. They have really enticing uh, physical athletic tools, but uh, they're just all majorly lacking in some way. Michael Porter Jr., I moved down to six. I had him one or two earlier, but with all these injury concerns, no way. Still worth rolling the dice on, but again, you'd rather have a healthy Kevin Knox than a, than a permanently uh, damaged goods Michael Porter Jr., right? So you could almost even um, switch these with a clean conscience. Luka Doncic, a guy we finally see a really high basketball IQ and passing ability, but he is held back by um, his lack of athleticism, lack of quick twitch. And another thing, he's already 230 pounds at like 18, 19 years old. What do you think he's going to weigh when he's uh, like 22, 23 years old? He's going to be pushing 240 easy, and it's only going to slow him down even more. And uh, so he might be able to he might be able to bully somewhat opposing uh, small forwards and shooting guards and point guards down in the post or something like that. But uh, defensively, it's going to really hurt him. And, uh, you know, teams are going to switch on to this guy, especially in the playoffs. And guys with more athleticism, with great length, you know, guys like Mikhail Bridges, they're just going to play right up on him and, uh, you know, force him to beat them. You know, he's going to have to pull out all the moves. He's going to get super tired out. And the fact is everyone <laughs> pretends that uh, this European basketball level is really high. Uh, and the fact is, Luka Doncic winning these MVP type awards by playing ever so slightly better than guys who never made it in the NBA. And I think in part of it is, you know, he's got the ball in his hands he's because he's the point guard. So he, he naturally gets more stats that way. And I think another issue is um, everyone wants to, everyone in Europe, you know, gets a self-esteem boost by Luka Doncic winning awards over there. So, you know, tie goes, tie goes to the great white hope, basically. <laughs> over there in Europe with those MVP awards, you know what I mean? Uh, obviously, he's no Dirk Nowitzki or anything like that, but they finally have a guy that they can hype and pretend who's a, you know going to be an elite NBA player. And, uh, yeah, for a continent that hasn't necessarily had a whole lot of success in the NBA lately, uh, you can understand the desire to hype this guy as the next great European hope or whatever. Trey Young, basically a smaller weaker Luka Doncic um, with even less of a defensive mentality. I think he'd be an absolutely amazing sixth man, you know, like a better Lou Williams because he's got that passing ability too. But as a starter, I think it's just going to be one of those situations like the uh, Portland Trailblazers where guys like Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum can make a really bad team into a, into a slightly above mediocre team. But once you get to the playoffs and other teams start focusing on their defensive weakness and their short height and all that, uh, suddenly those teams have a severe ceiling. Just like kind of like the Celtics with uh, Isaiah Thomas, you know, like sure he was great in the regular season and puts up put up lots of mon lots of numbers. But when you get to the playoffs, um, you know you're suddenly uh, a Rajon Rondo injury away from getting swept in the first round or something like that, you know? Because uh, teams are, you know, imagine this guy being switched on to LeBron James, right? Even at the college level, uh, teams were already totally targeting him on defense and uh, tearing him up, just tearing him up. So he will fill it up, and he will be a nice circus act in the regular season. But for a team that's really trying to win championships, uh, it's not going to work. And uh, not that anybody cares at this level of the draft with all these crap teams. They're just concerned about selling tickets and becoming a me becoming a mediocre team. That's the first step in their in their dream of winning a championship. So you kind of lose track of that uh, performance in the playoff type stuff because, uh, you know, that's the least of your worries right now. 
Wendell Carter, just a rock solid uh, role playing big man. I'm concerned about the uh, assist to turnover ratio, the high level of turnovers, especially in the post. He doesn't appear, you know, if he was a great passer, I was ready to put him up here, but it doesn't look like he's a great passer at all. It looks like he's really, you know, he, like he makes good passes, but uh, overall he just makes tons of mistakes and gets nervous and some of that stuff. So I'm putting him down here. Um, you know, I don't think he's going to be a, a, a Jaleel Lokafor, but uh, yeah, just somewhat limited, but still, you know, a rock solid rotation player who may even start on a really good team. Colin Sexton, uh, uh, let's see, I actually like him more than Trey Young, but Trey Young's going to get a lot more points in the regular season, And uh, but the thing is, like Colin Sexton, everybody says he's a strong point guard, right? Turns out he only weighs like five pounds more than Trey Young, you know? So this isn't even like anywhere close to Terry Rozier type strength, and uh, you know, even Kyrie Irving is actually significantly stronger than this. He's also a little smaller than expected. So he might basically be De'Aaron Fox without some of the rebounding and uh, with a slightly better shot. And that's great, but, you know, De'Aaron Fox was overrated last year, and it turns out that Dennis Smith was probably overrated as well. Uh, but Colin Sexton, a guy who's even faster than, than Dennis Smith Jr., in part because he weighs less, and a guy who's uh, probably an even better finisher around the rim than Dennis Smith Jr. Um, so he's very interesting. He's just on the small side. You can't really switch him onto. It's not like he can guard shooting guards or small forwards or anything like that, right? And even a lot of these bigger point guards are going to probably bully him pretty good. Um, so he could ultimately just end up as a either an average above average point guard on a bad team or a guy who ends up being a six man on a championship team, you know, a guy who comes in and gives you a crazy spark. Uh, but just some of the advanced stats are turning away from guys like Colin Sexton, who just are too small in size and too weak in size and lack versatility on the defensive end. And, uh, you know, even Avery Bradley guys, you might think he was a great defender because he looked quick against uh, opposing point guards. But just defending point guards at a decent level with on-ball defense doesn't make you a good defender overall because you're going to get killed when you get switched on to shooting guards, small forwards. You're not going to be rebounding. You know, it's just going to hurt you all over. But if he can play like a total warrior and get to the line at will and uh, you know survive that contact and stay healthy for an ongoing basis, he could actually start boost in his value significantly um you know in an ideal situation he could he could be as good or better than uh luka Doncic. and then robert williams i don't know uh you know he's at least got the great defensive talent uh probably more talented athletically than like a draymond green you know and t- taller and longer as well and more athletic than draymond green but obviously lacking the leadership and the focus and the uh, probably the work ethic too, for sure, and all those other things that make Draymond Green so great. So because he's got that crazy talent in the right situation with good coaching, he, you can probably put him in there for 20 minutes a game, and he can probably give you some really good, uh, hopefully, energy in, that, in those minutes and uh, situationally shut down a lot of guys. And he might even be a good guy to throw against a guy like LeBron James because he's got the great wingspan, he's got the good height, and uh, he's really, really quick laterally. So, uh, you know, another guy to throw at LeBron James, but you can also throw him on Kevin Love or Tristan Thompson. or uh, He's got some really nice versatility. Any team would be happy to have him. So, yeah, maybe some Tristan Thompson type, up, type upside uh, with uh, some superior athleticism. All right, guys, that's just my first uh, big board. And again, just take it with a grain of salt because, uh, you know, I haven't even watched these dudes play. So this is mostly a, a, a blind, half-assed take, everything I just said. All right, let me know what you guys think. I'll see you soon. Peace.